Hello, Lake Erie Council. Welcome back. Today is Wednesday. We are halfway through our week. Uh, we're excited to be joined by Casey. She's back with us. And then we have Chief Wasi with us, who is, um, we're really excited about having him with us today to uh, investigate our forensic in adventure for our bear dens. Uh, so uh, if we have not start off, hey Casey, you want to start us off? I will. So just as we start every meeting, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance and then the Scout Oath and Law. So if you're in uniform, please do the Scout Salute. If not, hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and we'll do the scout oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And now the law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Okay, Casey, take it away. All right. So I want to say thank you so much, Chief Wasi, for joining us today to talk about this um, forensic adventure for the bears. And I want to go through a couple of the points that we're going to hit um, to meet these requirements. So the first one is talk with your family or your den about forensics and how it's used to help solve crimes. So I pose that question to you, Chief Wasi. So what do we do um, in forensics? How, do, how does that help us solve a crime? Uh, the definition for forensics is the application of scientific knowledge and methods in order to solve a crime. So uh, in the field that I work uh, at, um, I'm one of two crime scene investigators, uh, certified technicians through the state of Ohio for our department. And when we go to a crime scene, we have a lot of different scientific tools. I have some of them here on the table. Um, and I use those tools to look for uh, evidence of the crime. Uh, so that I can identify who victims are and who suspects potentially are. Okay. I'm super curious, actually, what kinds of things um, would you um, pick up or find at a crime scene that would help you? Would it be like hair or fingerprints? Like what kinds of things do you guys find? We look for everything and anything that's brought okay. into the scene Okay. Uh, that could have been brought into the scene by somebody. We look for things that may be missing in a crime scene, things that should be there, but okay. are for some reason gone. Uh, we're, we're looking for hair, skin cells, blood, uh, DNA samples. Uh, we're looking for um, uh, things that may have fallen off somebody's shoes or you know, if their clothes were dirty and they knelt down or they touched something. Uh, these are all things we're looking for. We're looking at, you know, does this, look like the normal kitchen? Do I have a lot of things thrown around? Um, is there a mess here that's not explainable? Are okay. there things broken in the room? These are all things that we look for, you know, and we photograph it and then take samples. Uh, some things we actually take back to the office. Uh, some things um, obviously are too big. So we will examine those items mm -hmm. to look for fingerprints and things of that nature. Okay, and when you say take samples, um, how, how do you take samples? I know we briefly, when we were talking before, you said um, you guys can actually vacuum um, an area. So tell me a little bit how, how that works. Well, we can use lint rollers, uh, oh, yeah. believe it or not. Those are things that you can buy at any store. And you know we can roll an area, it'll pick up hair. And then uh, the, the lint roller sheet will go to the lab and they will isolate all those individual hairs. So they'll identify whether it's animal hair or human hair and then they'll see which ones potentially have DNA on them, and then they'll be able to run those hairs for DNA. Uh, skin cells, the same thing. Uh, if there's unusual chemicals on a scene or if there's blood on a scene, then uh, we'll use, uh, we have some special liquids and, and um, swabs that we use to pick up those samples. 
and seal them up and then send them to the lab and the lab can then identify them and get, get DNA out of, out of those samples as well. Uh -huh. uh, we can take clothing in, they can examine clothing uh, for anything that, uh, that was left at a scene or, or any evidence of who might have been involved in the crime. Okay, and so like you can even like pick up like mud, like on a, a boot or something like that, maybe that had been tracked into the house or even on the clothing and analyze all of that, right? If they have walked across the dusty floor, I can photograph the footprints off of the dust. If they've walked through the yard in a mud in the mud, I can cast prints and actually come up with a with a casted print of what the shoe is. Oh wow! Uh, we and can do tire analysis the same way, and then uh, potentially identify based on the cast or based on the the photo. Yeah, Which and one of the things I usually do with the scouts when we do this in person is I'll take a, uh, and then the kids can do this at home. Um, if you uh, take one of those clear, uh, clear silicone shoe shine, um, there's a little hand shoe shine. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. And make sure it's the clear silicone, not an ink one, or not, a, not a, a polished one. But you rub that on the bottom of your shoe and have them step on a piece of cardboard. Yeah. And then like I can take uh, fingerprint powder or, or some kind of powder and I can run it across there and it will stick to his shoe. Oh, okay. And even though I may have three kids in the class with the exact same shoe, all of those kids shoes are worn differently because of the way they walk. Oh yeah. So by taking that shoe print, you know, I can actually identify that that wasn't these other two people, his friends that were there wearing the same shoe, it was his shoe. Based because on the, the wear way, pattern. Because of the way it's worn, yes. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. All right, so I, I kind of want to move on to the next point of this requirement because it, it's actually got me a little bit excited. Um, so you're supposed to take fingerprints and then learn how to analyze them. But I think before we do that, can we talk a little bit about fingerprints and how they're really unique um, to the individual? So the, I know there's a few different kinds of fingerprints. Yeah. Um, or, or basic kind of designs, if right. you will, for fingerprints. Uh, actually, what I first tell people is, why do we have fingerprints? I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we have fingerprints because, you know, it's to be for identification. Well, you know, you weren't born with prints, so we could later identify you. Right. And we just use that as a tool. But uh, if you stop and think, if you look at your hands, not only do your fingers, tips have these ridges in them, your whole hand has it. Yeah. And then your feet, it's the same thing, your toes and your whole feet. Uh, if you didn't have those ridges, you'd never be able to pick and hold any, pick anything up and hold it because it would slide out of your hand. Like Spider-Man. So they're friction ridges. They're ridges that, uh, that allow you to grip onto things and to hold things. You know, almost like a tree frog that can climb up, a, you know, he has deeper ridges so he can climb a tree, but you know, it, it's the same, it's the same principle. That's why- well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm definitely gonna stick with I'm Spider-Man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, generally, if I'm, if I'm going to look at and identify fingerprints, I'm going to move this a little closer so that you can see it. Uh, the three basic patterns that we look for in a fingerprint okay. are arches, loops, and whirls. So if you look at your, at your fingerprint, uh, some of you may have only arches. Uh, some of you may have some loops surrounded by arches. And some of you may have actually all of these things in your fingerprint. But what your fingerprint is, is a mixture of all of these different things, these loops, these arches, and these whirls. And uh, they're just all jumbled together on your finger. And uh, these fingerprints are different for everybody. Nobody has ever, they've never found two people with identical fingerprints. Even if you're identical twins, if there's any twins in your, <coughs> excuse me, your scalp pack, uh, this is a good exercise for them because they can each take their index fingers and print their fingers and they'll realize that even identical twins' fingerprints are different. They're not the same. I see, I think you can probably see that I'm, I'm fingerprinting myself right now. So as I do that, um, can we talk about actually um, other things on the parts of the body that are unique um, to the individual? I know we talked a little bit about ears, which was 
right. kind of fascinating um, for me. Uh, ears, ears are unique. Uh, as I said before, I mentioned before, your, your toe prints, footprints, uh, those are unique. Your lips, uh, the patterns from your lips, you know, if you were to, uh, for instance, place your lips on a piece of glass, you'll be able to see ridges, mm -hmm. just like you have in fingerprints. And uh, those prints are unique. And a lot of times, even the creases in your forehead uh, are unique as well. And a lot of times, you know, you can, you can identify people by that. Um, also, you know, there, there's a lot out there now with facial recognition okay. where it measures the distance between your eyes and the comparison of your eyes with your nose, with your mouth, with your lips and, you know, where your cheekbones are. And, uh, there's a lot of technology involved with that. And then you can go past that to voice printing, okay. uh, stress, stress printing, stress, uh, analysis of, of a person's voice. There's a lot of different, uh, methods, scientific methods we can use to help identify someone. Okay. So I'm just going to, um, here's my fingerprints. Now I'm not a professional. Um, if we can see kind of any loops or ridges or anything in there. Um, but all I did to do this was kind of cool. We just have just an ink pad. Um, and I, I rolled it on and now I've, I've actually seen you do this with the scouts. Um, and you kind of, you get it all over, right? But then you, you roll it, yeah. right? You don't just put it down, you roll it. So that way you get kind of all of the, the ridges and, and all of and that what, in there. When you do that, make sure you don't press real hard on the paper. Okay. You usually just real lightly on the paper as you roll. You know, that's oh, so yeah, see that? See, I did that. And yeah. now you can it, see The it. upper ones are much better. Okay. Right. All right. So then you could probably, even if you're at home and you're you wanting to do this, um, find a marker, right? Just kind of a washable marker um, <laughs> and, you know, color your fingertips. And as she washes it, don't press too hard, but you want to roll it. So then you can see all of the different things inside your fingerprint. You can do that also with that clear silicone shoe polish thing. Okay. You do that, then you put it on paper and then you can use uh, any kind of powder, a uh, colored powder, makeup powder. Okay. Uh, that will will actually bring out that print as well because it'll stick to the uh, the what we're looking for is is like when you sweat or just when you're just doing normal things, there are amino acids that permeate through your fingertips. Okay. In your hands, and when you leave a print, that print is in the amino acids, and a lot of my powders that I use react to that amino acid okay. and it, and there's a lot of liquid chemicals as well that we can use on paper or fragile items uh, uh things that um uh, i wouldn't want to use you know powders on uh, okay there's, there's chemical processing as well and now i know that you have a way um to show us how you lift a fingerprint from a crime scene right and i would be anxious to find out um kind of your guys's process and how you do that uh, a lot of different things we can do, uh, but really there's 90% of what we use is, is powder okay. to find fingerprints. Now I have several different types of powder. Uh, I have a sheet of paper here that uh, I've touched, my wife has touched, and um, the one item that we use is just standard black powder. Now the powders that we use are actually made from volcanic ash. Oh, really? And lava, uh, lava. They uh, grind it all up into a real, real, real fine powder. And it has, has good properties for uh, sticking to those amino acids. Now I see you kind of twirling that brush. Is that, right. um, you should always twirl it and not just kind of like swipe it up and down. Right. Okay. Now this is just regular powder. And you can see that I have brought up several prints. Oh, yeah. Uh, the second powder we use a lot is a magnetic powder. Okay. It's a real, real fine, like iron shavings. Okay. And I use a magnet to apply it. And I use a magnet to pick up all the extras. Yeah, I was going to say, it didn't, so there's no waste. Okay. 
And you can see that that brought up some additional fingerprints. Oh, wow, yeah. And actually, now, it, it kind of looks to me, or did it just kind of, it's like a double layer. It almost looks darker when you use the magnet. Uh, the magnetic can be a little bit darker sometimes. Okay. Um, and the magnetic is good for if it's a real oily print, you know, uh, but like if I'm going to be using, the next powder I'm going to use is a fluorescent powder. Uh, and there's specific reasons that I use that. And we'll go over that. But if if this was my piece of evidence right here, this would be real easy. I would take this, I'd put it in a manila envelope, I'd put all the information on it, and I'd submit it to my property room manager. Okay, if I if these fingerprints were on your dresser in your bedroom, mm -hmm. he's probably gonna frown when I haul that dresser into his evidence room. <laughs> so uh, that's not gonna work. So right. I will do, if this was the top of your dresser, I'm going to take my camera and I'm going to photograph all of those fingerprints with the, with the ruler in it so that they can size everything to get the exact size of the print. Okay. And then I'm going to use some kind of a lifting media to lift the print off of it. I'm going to demonstrate. So when you say um, lift the print, um, so it, is, that's adhesive, right? Yes, it's like a tape. Okay. Now, I would imagine you'd have to be careful not to then touch the other side of the tape. I'd be wearing gloves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, I have a like this lifter right here. Right. Now, I'm going to lift that off. And I'm going to squeeze these together. Now you'll see my print is missing oh, wow, yeah. from the paper and it's on this card. So now that goes in and that goes into an envelope into the evidence room for the, with the case number, the date, the time, where it was found, who lifted the print. Uh, so one of the things you don't see on TV is the amount of paperwork that goes into every one of these things. No, because on TV, they just, they lift the print and like 10 minutes later, they've got the result and the yeah. guy's in jail, right? Yeah, yeah, so, it's not that fast. So it doesn't quite happen that way. How long, how long does it actually take to get like a fingerprint analysis back? Uh, that's another thing you don't see on TV. A lot of times when they do the print and it comes up on the machine, it says it's this person, this is their picture and so on. In real life, the computer is actually not as good as the human eye. Okay. So the computer will give generally four or five potential matches. And then a human examiner will go and then actually physically examine and determine which, which of those is actually the proper print. So, you know, the computer, I would imagine the computer technology will get much better as time moves on, but uh, currently it's, it's not there yet completely. And now, so all of this fingerprinting um, and actually narrowing down a suspect really is determined by that person having been fingerprinted at some time, right? Whether they, you know, they have done it in the in their youth, yeah. or or if if I have a reason to believe that uh, you know that you I have uh, a preponderance of evidence that you may be involved, even if you don't have fingerprints somewhere else. I can get a court order to have you fingerprinted. Okay. Um, uh, or a lot of times we will fingerprint family members to rule them out. Because oh. I know, or if I had EMS, if I had an ambulance on the scene and they weren't wearing gloves and they left prints, you know, we'll fingerprint the EMS people uh, that were there and 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 rule out those people as, as okay. being the ones. So there. you can actually, by narrowing it down that way, it's you can actually potentially catch a sus suspect in that and way. Not only can you catch the person, but you can rule people out to right. make suspects, and you can it it allow you then to move your investigation towards somebody different. Right, and and being uh, ruled out is always a good thing. <laughs> always a good thing. Yes. Uh, the other thing I wanted to demonstrate is one of the other powders we use is called a fluorescent powder. Okay. Uh, this is a piece of black plastic. I do have some fingerprints on here. And I have a special brush with special powders. And you're gonna look at that and you're gonna say, well, I don't see anything on that or hardly see anything. Nothing on there. 
But I'm going to turn my lights off here. Okay. <gasps> that is cool. And even cooler is when you look through a, an orange barrier. It's not going to show up as well on the computer. There it goes. Okay. Wow. There's a lot more prints on here, actually, than I thought there were. <laughs> so Lots of people have been touching that. Oh, wow. So would you, so what kind of instance would you use that type of fingerprinting as opposed good to? Good question. It, the uh, types of things I would use this, uh, these powders on computer equipment. Okay. Because a lot of this other dust will get into the electronics and it'll damage it. Oh. Uh, this uses so little, I mean, I can sit here and shake this and there's no dust coming off of this. Okay. You know, they, it uses such a small amount. Uh, other reasons that I will use this is let's say I'm going to, I have a fingerprint right here on this, on this uh, Gatorade. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of different colors in this label. And if I was to get a, find a fingerprint on that and uh, dust that print and try to photograph it, it'd be hard to. Yeah, hard you wouldn't be able to see print. it. But what I can do is I can turn the light off. I can put one of those yellow filters on my camera and then use the blue light. And the only thing that will show up in the picture is the print. All of that other color in the background is gone. Another thing I would use this for is let's say, and we, I do this a lot. We have somebody break into a house and break into your medicine cabinet and steal your, your drugs out of your medicine cabinet. Mm. Uh, try to take a picture of a fingerprint on a mirror. Yeah, well, you're, you're not gonna, gonna, you're not gonna get it. a picture right? of me taking a picture of yeah. myself <laughs> on the mirror. The same thing you do when you're doing selfies mm -hmm. up in, a, in the bathroom mirror. So what I can do in the same occurrence is I can make the bathroom completely black. I can use the blue light to fluoresce the print, put the camera on the lens and all I'm photographing is the prints themselves. Uh -huh. So, and that would also work on a chrome bumper on a car or, uh, or things of that nature or windows on a car. It's, uh, it's so much easier to do it that way. All right. So those are some of the different, those are the main types of powders that I'll use. And, uh, you know, I have all different sizes of lifters. Um, we had talked before that uh, I even have lifters that will list, lift dust footprints. Uh, like somebody walks across a dusty floor and left footprints. You know, I can, I can angle lights so I can get photos of those with a ruler so I can get the foot size. Uh, and I can also have, they call it an electrostatic lifter. Okay. Where you, it's a sheet, a real thin sheet of mylar plastic. Mm -hmm. And you uh, lay it on top of the print. You uh, expose it to DC current and the static electricity pulls the dust up into the mylar wow. and, and leaves you and leaves a print there. That is so fascinating. There, okay. there are a lot of different, a lot of different things, you know, you know, I would I would recommend to the to the kids if they want to do the like the, the footprint that I would normally do that. If you have a, a, like a manila file folder at home, mm -hmm. take that clear silicone uh, shoe shoe buffer yeah. off the bottom of your print and just walk on to that uh, manila okay. folder. Yeah. And then you can use like a like a dark makeup powder or something like that real lightly across it and it should bring out your print. Wow. So that's something. That's something that you can do at home. I might, I might do that later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to earn this belt loop. Uh, <laughs> so the next thing I, I kind of want to talk to you about um, chromatography, or as you said, chemical analysis um, to me earlier. So how do we use chemical analysis in solving crimes? Like where do we, how do we analyze a, a chemical? That's beyond my area of expertise okay which is, which is one of the things that when you start talking about about crime scene you know uh, a lot of what we do in the in the police field is we actually search for the evidence mm -hmm. once we find the evidence you know like some of it we process in our own office there's certain drug tests we can do mm -hmm. that kind of go on with that we have called what they call nick kits we can put a drug in there if we suspect that it's like if we suspect it's meth we can put a little sample of it in and then we have vials that break and it does, it changes color. 
based on what chemical it is. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we are able to, uh, uh, a lab technician, you know, we're, we're able to do that kind of a test. Yeah. If it's a little bit more intense than that, then there are lab technicians at BCI, uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigation mm -hmm. in Ohio. Uh, there's five labs uh, located in all different places in the state. Uh, we usually go to Richfield for ours. Okay. One in Toledo. There's one in uh, our Dayton area, one in Cincinnati, one in uh, Columbus. And then there's one somewhere down in the Athens area. I'm not sure where, where that one's at. And, and so in these kinds of places, they would analyze things like, um, like blood or DNA? They would do DNA, chemical analysis. They would do uh, uh, special photography. Uh, they can actually, in certain cases, you can actually fingerprint a body Ooh. To, for somebody who has handled it. Um, they would be doing, they would be doing all the DNA analysis. Uh, there are so many different, you know, it's, if you like science, you like working in a lab, they are always hiring. All right. You know, at, uh, to work at these forensic labs. Um, and there's, there's, uh, I'm also certified as an arson investigator. And um, I, uh, any, any samples I take in an arson fire actually go to a separate lab. They go to the uh, fire marshal's lab and uh, they analyze those down there because their lab is set up to handle highly explosive uh, chemicals and materials, you know, where the normal labs wouldn't be able to do that. So do in, in arson, um, so that's actually one of um, one of the requirements on here is um, talking about different um, jobs within forensic science. And so obviously an arson investigator is one of those um, and kind of what you would do, um, what that entails as a job. So do you collect, you collect the samples and then you send them to a lab for further investigation? Well, an arson investigator, uh, for years, I've been the arson investigator for Jefferson Fire Department, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not strictly a police job. Okay. They, re they recently, two years ago, they sent two of their own firefighters to the fire marshal's office, and they now are, they have some certified uh, crime, uh, fire scene investigators there. But it, they handle a scene very much like I'll handle a, a crime scene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my average crime scene, I probably take between 200 and 500 photos. Oh, wow. You know, because once it moves or it changes, it's gone. Right, right. So, and with digital photography, and we moved to digital photography about 15, 20 years ago. You, you can know, take lots of pictures. Came out, yeah. you know, now you're not trying to develop film. You're not, you know what pictures show up, what don't. Right. You can enhance pictures to in certain situations to, uh, to bring out the evidence. There's so much that can be done with digital photography. But they'll, they'll photograph, they'll gradually remove items from the scene. And, uh, you know, I, I've had some interesting arson investigations as well. You know, some of the things that you can do are, are really amazing with that. So they identify, um, so these labs that, you know, after the evidence is collected, they can identify what started the fire. If like an accelerant was used, like, you yeah. know, so gasoline or something like that, or right. if it was an electric and, fire. And, uh, a lot of times it can isolate those chemicals right down to the manufacturer. Oh, wow. Because each manufacturer makes our product a little bit different. Sure. So they have like a little the, signature. The recipe, that. the recipe is different. Right. And I, I guess I would assume um, that that would make it easier to catch the suspect. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Because now you can connect your suspect with that particular company's product. Right. Okay. You know, so there's a lot of, a lot of things that you can do with that. So it is a, um, um, it's a real interesting uh, field to get into. Okay. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of other things you can do in forensic science. You know, you could be a sketch artist. You could be just a forensic photographer. You know, if you have in some of the larger cities where you have a, an, an awful lot of crime, mm -hmm. you know, they may have just a forensic photographer. You know, they, they learn how to take photos in all different environments. Um, I, I went to school for uh, three weeks in just in photography. Oh, okay. You get my certification, you know, and, and I can shoot at night. I can shoot in, uh, in low contrast or high contrast light. I can alter things so that I can focus in on the different, uh, different things I want to show in the photo. Okay. Um, you have sketch artists. Uh, you have uh, another interesting, even if you are a, uh, 
you like you like math, you like figures. Um, there are forensic accountants. Oh, okay. um, we a lot of times when we're dealing with fraud cases, uh, I'll either call the FBI's for a, a forensic accounting team or BCI also has a forensic accounting team and they'll be able to come down and do like a full company audit or audit somebody's bank trail. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of tools they have at their disposal. Following that. the money. Following That's, the money. So all you cubs out there that really love math, keep that in mind. There's a job for you. Yeah. Um, also, I, I'd say if, just if you want to get into this, if you want to get into uh, the police field, you know, I, I alluded it to it before. There's a lot of paperwork that goes on with this. You know, there's also a lot of training and education. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to school. I go to school every year. You right. know, everything changes so rapidly in this field. Science changes so much right. that uh, I, I do at least two seminars or conferences a year just in the new technologies that are out. Um, you know, we, when DNA first came out, people thought, oh, you'll never use that. And within six months, we solved a robbery and we solved an assault case with DNA. And, and that is kind of like your main, that's what you use, right? So, um, and you had mentioned um, a forensic sketch artist. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because that actually, seems, I can't draw, but yeah. it seems fascinating. If they look like a stick figure, I could probably. Yeah, I, I could draw landscape. I can't draw faces. I've never been good at that. If it's just uh, but, a smiley face, I can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> Chances yeah, are it isn't. They're, they're a lot more intense. I mean, they can say, well, no, the nose needs to be a little a little, uh, little thinner, or needs to be fatter, the eyes a little farther apart. You know, there's a little bit of a slant on it, and they'll go through and they'll redraw this. Um, and, and if they're, a lot of them now are doing the digital drawings, which it's much easier to manipulate the photo. Sure. You know, so that, the, or the drawings, so that it can get exactly what the person saw. Wow. So, yeah, there are a lot of different fields there. And uh, with this, with a, a forensic, a forensic sketch artist, um, you know, I always see those um, age enhanced images. So if, you know, maybe had somebody had gone missing and then 10 years later, this is what we think they would look like. So would that fall under that field as well? Uh, it can. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, sketch artists are also graphic artists. Okay. So they can do, there's a lot of digital programs out there that they can manipulate to make somebody look older. Uh, those of you who unfortunately may have gotten involved in some of that on Facebook, um, <laughs> uh, some of those things were actually scams to get information from you. But, oh, uh, yeah. you know, those, those programs are out there to aid you, you know, and uh, a lot of your sketch artists are multi-dimensional. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they do sketching, they do graphic arts, they do computer, uh, computer graphics and, uh, I mean, so almost any field that interests you uh, in the sciences, you're probably going to be able to find a connection there. And a lot of departments now uh, in their crime scene people, um, some of the larger departments, their crime scene units mm -hmm. uh, are not even police officers. They, okay. they are people who went to college for forensics oh. and they're they are actually civilian crime scene people. Yeah, we're, we're scientists, right? Yeah. And they're, they are pure science. Yeah, you know, yeah. And as a police officer, I'm looking at suspects when I, as soon as I walk through a place. Right. You know, who do I think did this? Where do I start this? This is what I'm seeing. This is, they are completely neutral. Yeah. They just let the evidence take it where they, where they have to go, so. And the, the evidence gives them the answer. Right. Okay. Um, now, so, so we talked about different kinds of jobs in forensics, and now the next point on this adventure is kind of really interesting to me. It's animals um, that work in forensics. So what kind of animals are we talking? Are we talking monkeys? Are we talking gerbils? 99% <laughs> of the time, it's going to be dogs. Okay. Um, and you, uh, dogs have such a an acute sense of smell. I mean, you, you can train the dogs to look for certain drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, with a lot of the things that are going now uh, in the marijuana field, uh, they are, um, they're using dogs for, uh, you know, they used to train them in, in all different kinds of drugs. Okay. And, uh, but now that if they, with the legalizing of marijuana to some extent, now they have to retrain the dogs not to smell marijuana. 
So, you know, they, so a lot of the newer it, dogs now are, are isolated to some of the other drugs that they're looking for. Can you teach an old dog new tricks then? Sometimes you can. You can sometimes add on, but you can't be track. Okay. Right. The dog can't sit there and tell you, well, you know, I think this is marijuana. He's just saying, I think there's drugs in the car. <laughs> so, uh, so but there's so, a lot of other things that uh, we talked about arson investigation. They have dogs that are trained to uh, sniff out explosives. Uh, they have other dogs that are trained to search out accelerants. Okay. You know, gasolines, kerosene, some kind of a, a flammable liquids. Uh, we have dogs that are are trained specifically to search for people. Okay. You know, we bring an article of clothing, this person we think may be unconscious somewhere out in the field, and that dog can follow the scent of that person to find the person. Um, they also have, like, if you have a building collapse or you're looking for a deceased person, they have what they call cadaver dogs. Okay. If you have somebody that's been buried in the ground, sometimes for years, you know, that, uh, that, that was a victim, you know, they can go into a field and they can, they can find that old grave that's in the ground. So now I have two questions. First one is, um, is it just one certain type of dog? Cause I know I've seen like, like German shepherds and, but there's like hound dogs. There's um, a lot of different it, dogs. Okay. So just depending on yeah. a trainable dog, right? Sometimes, sometimes it's just if it's a trainable dog, you know, hound dogs are real good at finding people. Yeah. That's like when you see all the old movies and they, they got all the hounds. Yep. They said, you know, hound dogs have a specific talent for finding people. Doesn't mean other dogs can't do it as well because they can. Yeah. Uh, but hound dogs are really good at it. Okay. Um, you know, some dogs are selected because of their ability to, to sniff things out and their, and their speed and agility. Yeah. You know, shepherds are fast. Uh, Malinamas are okay. extremely fast. There isn't anyone who can outrun one of those. Um, there are, you know, there's some, some places use beagles. Uh, there are some places that use small dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, all dogs have the talent. It's just the ability to train that dog to do it. Uh, now, I have an 11-year-old beagle, and I will tell you, she can smell any piece of food that is dropped <laughs> on the floor for like miles so but you know these, these dogs are trained differently you know they are when they, in their training they are trained to respond in a certain way when they isolate a drug okay you know so if they smell these 10 different things that they've been trained for they'll either they'll either scratch at it or they'll sit it's an automatic trained response that they do okay food you know they'll react to yeah that's food you know yeah, let me eat it. There are some places, like if you ever do any international travel, you know, a lot of times you can't bring food into a country or out of the country. Right. They actually have dogs that are trained to sniff out food in your luggage or food that you're transporting in and out. Right, right. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, the dogs are just ex extremely trainable. Um, you so know, my, my second question now, and I know, so these dogs that are, they have this training, they to have a handler that they live with right yes is the dog and stop me if this is silly compensated how does that work so technically i would imagine the dog is an officer right um the dog is now in some countries it doesn't work this way i know in canada you know they have their handler the dog stays at the station oh, okay uh, typically across the United States, the dog is considered the canine handler's partner. Okay. So they are together all the time. Sure. You know, they live together. They know their family. They protect the family. They are, uh, you know, they generally when the officer retires, the dog stays with that officer. Okay. Now, as far as compensation, uh, you know, we pay for their, uh, you know, when we have a canine, we pay for their medical expenses. You know, there's a certain amount of money for food. You know, the, the dog has to have, the dog and the handler, each has to have eight to 16 hours of training every month. Okay. You know, and that's, you know, they are, the yeah, handlers compensated for that. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, you can't really pay a dog. Yeah, well, I'm- All I mean, a dog really wants is companionship. And, and, and food, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I will say, yes, they are compensated. <laughs> um, so that's actually really fantastic. Um, so one of the other things on this belt loop requirement, this adventure requirement is actually visiting your local police department. Right. Um, and find out how they collect evidence. I think we kind of covered all of that. Um, and right now, obviously, there's no in-person visiting nope. going on. Um, do you have anything further you would like to add just on collecting evidence, um, anything on forensics? Um, the, biggest, the biggest advice I can give to people is pay attention in science class. Read. Yes. Read a lot. Yeah. Uh, reading is very important and um, and learn to enjoy school because uh, all of my officers, I mean, it's not just me, all of my officers have a certain amount of, of training requirements that they have to do, mm -hmm. you know, every year just to keep their cert uh, certifications up. So well, yeah. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of reading, a lot of writing. Uh, you, you learn, you know, when you, everybody hates to do a book report, everybody hates to do a, any kind of a report. But that's what we do. You know, we yeah. write reports. Yeah. You pay attention in English, learn how to articulate, mm -hmm. learn how to talk to people. Right. You know, these are all important qualities and important traits. You know, if you're going to be an investigator and you're going to be working, working. I mean, if you're a lab technician, you have to learn to play well with others and within your lab. You know, and when you're out in the field doing crimes, you know, you have to, you know, work with people, right. you know, work with victims you know, work with uh, witnesses, you know, and there's all different ways that you talk to and deal with all of these people. And it, it's an interesting field to be in. I've been, uh, I'm in year 42 of this. Oh, wow. So, um, and rapidly approaching retirement. So. <laughs> hey, I don't want to hear that. I live in Jefferson. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, that, that would be my advice, you know, um, you have to, in, in, the, in the law enforcement career, you can't be a police officer till you're 21. Okay. So uh, what I tell kids all the time is uh, when you graduate from high school, you know, go, go to college, get two yeah. years, three year, get a, get a two year degree in criminal justice, public, public administration, even liberal arts, you know, writing, you know, report writing, you know, uh, writing classes. Uh, use that two years wisely. Mm -hmm. uh, because now in this day and age, you know, your, your ability to be promoted is going to be determined by your education in most cases. Well, and, and I would get think more money for it, depending on your education. Right. So as far as like relating, uh, you know, scouting into law enforcement, um, a lot of the things that we teach our cubs in scouting, you're halfway you there. use, right? <laughs> you, you're going to use later in life, especially if you're in um, law enforcement or even forensic science. Um, Honor, integrity, nothing can, nothing can beat those. Exactly. And, and I always like to say that, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I deal a lot with kids, you know, in the school system, in mm -hmm. the, and I, you know, in the general public. I can honestly tell you that career scouts especially, but anyone who's been involved in a scouting program, you know, for any amount of time, I don't generally have to deal with because they have been taught honor, integrity, you know, uh, uh, all of the things, the core values that, that you need to have to be a good human being. And, uh, you know, that is, is such an important thing. That's why, you know, I, I, you know, my, one of my sons is an Eagle Scout, um, uh, Cub Scout Kevin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, a lot of his growing up, you know, was molded by scouting. Yeah. And and probably a little bit by me. So just maybe this <laughs> but, much. Uh, right? But scouting was is a is a big, a good big influence. And I try to I try to encourage people to, to participate in scouting all they can. Well and you know I think your words, you know, being being a father of an Eagle Scout, um, and you know, in law enforcement and your positive words about scouting really speaks highly of the, the program in general. Um, and, you know, so all of these youth kind of going through it, um, you know, stick with it, continue because, you know, there's a- I absolutely love to see that on an application. See? <laughs> Perfect, that, right? That, that is, uh, you know, the military looks for that. Mm -hmm. A lot of big corporations look for that. 
because what it does is it shows that this is a person with commitment that, yes. that has learned commitment. Yep. You know, and learn to obey. Yep. You know, and 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 there, it's 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 exactly what what people are looking for in a job application. Mm, that's fantastic. So, I will just um, kind of go over the things that we talked about really quickly. Um, so, the first point was talking with your family or den about forensics and how it's used to solve crimes. So, we we did that right in the beginning, um, and then our fingerprints. And we talked a lot about fingerprinting and don't do it this way <laughs> because you can't see what it looks like. Do it this way. Um, and a little bit about chemical analysis and um, how, you know, most of that stuff gets sent off to a lab um, for further analysis. And we talked about visiting the sheriff's office or police station. Um, you know, when we go back to, you know, in-person meetings, um, you know, call your local department and maybe get that arranged. Um, the different jobs in forensic science, there are so many. Um, there will be a link um, in the comment section and you can actually go on there and do a little bit of research and maybe find one that speaks to you a little bit. Um, you know, the sketch artist, the arson investigator, um, forensic photography, there's just so many. Um, and then animals in forensic science. So we learned about drug sniffing dogs and bomb sniffing dogs. Um, if they are or not uh, compensated, I'm going to go with yes. Yeah. Um, and how they can actually um, be retrained. Um, and I think all of that is fantastic. So that's a lot of information. Um, and I want to personally thank you for all that you and your department is doing, um, especially right now, because you guys are really in it um, and still continuing to keep us safe. Like I said, I'm I'm in Jefferson, so you are my police chief. Um, so I thank you for that. I have a very dedicated staff that I, I really enjoy working with. I'm proud to have them on my staff. Um, and for those local scouts that uh, didn't get a chance to play with the, the equipment, um, we will set up a time once this is all over uh, that yes. you can get some hands-on experience in doing that. Yes, uh, they would love that. Um, yeah, so we, we love all of your officers. Um, I know, you know, Officer Greg's fantastic and, he, you know, just, it's just really amazing. So I want to thank you again for all that you do. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, You're very welcome. I enjoy it. And giving us so much information. I think I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so you can find the bare requirements, um, on the web page or on the website um, and re go over anything and continue to watch the video learn some more stuff follow the link that's in the comment section about the forensic careers and you can actually learn a lot of information there too awesome thank you guys so much we really appreciate it um, i think we learned about uh, observation and listening skills and following instructions how important that is in the process of gathering all of the different uh, forensic and then also working as a team and helping each other. So I think we had a wonderful uh, DEN meeting today. Uh, I appreciate you both being here. Uh, I don't know if we ever introduced you, but this uh, at the end of the thing, we'll, we'll introduce you. Um, this is uh, Chief Wasi. He's the chief of the Jefferson Police Department mm -hmm. in uh, Ashtabula County. Um, so we really appreciate all you guys are doing and, uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks for, uh, tuning in. We have, uh, our Weeblos tomorrow. So hopefully see you all then. Bye guys. Goodbye.